Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from Dr. Lillis' lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's an author of several books, including Hidden Mountain's Secret Garden, A Theological Contemplation on Prayer, and Fire from Above, Christian Contemplation and Mystical Wisdom. In this particular series of conversations, we'll focus on the spiritual writings of St. Teresa of Avila, and in particular, her autobiography. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Anthony, thank you so much for joining me. It's wonderful to be with you, Chris. Thank you for making all these conversations available. Discerning Hearts is doing such a powerful thing. I've heard from Carmelite friends all over the world about Discerning Hearts and Chris McGregor. I was with the Missionaries of Charity in San Francisco in an old Carmelite priest who was kind of serving as chaplain for them. He came up to me after Mass and he goes, Hidden Mountain Secret Garden. And he kind of let me know that he had been following some of the conversations going on at Discerning Hearts. And I could tell it built up his priesthood. And I think that effect that Discerning Hearts has is something remarkable and a gift to the church all over the place. And so, Chris, we all owe you a big thank you. Well, just praise God. It's just giving back what he's offering to all of us. And we're so blessed to have you, Anthony, to be able to break open, or how can I say unwrap the gift? It's not even break it open. It's more gently to open it up and to be able to view it. And a lot of times what you're showing us is this multifaceted diamond from all the different angles and all the different ways the light kind of penetrates. And ultimately, you know what that diamond is. It's really more of our own human hearts. And in reading Teresa of Avila, Elizabeth the Trinity, Therese, John the Cross, the great Carmelites, but also the many of the great saints, that's ultimately what they're trying to show us, isn't it? Or what they're trying to reveal to us? Yes, that you know, God has created us for this great purpose, and there's something wonderful about who we are. When we put ourselves in relationship to him, it's also possible that we betray our the gift that we are, and it is possible for us to completely ruin it. And But that's not what God wants. It's not really what we want either. And so he comes to us in all our insecurities and fears, and he kind of breaks through our indifference to him. That's probably the big enemy in the beginning. He breaks through our indifference to him until we connect with him. And then he opens up beautiful possibilities before us as we see how good he is. Those who see the goodness of God, those who know the goodness of the Father, what they have is hope because they they realize how good his intention is towards them personally and that he's inviting them into a great work. And with that hope and with a sense of the future, a soul kind of steps out beyond itself, and God is able to reveal his glory through it. People who otherwise are walking in darkness get to glimpse a great light whenever any soul does that. And that's why I'm very excited about our conversations right now on Teresa of Avila and her life, because she is a soul that had to break through her indifference to God and begin to see his goodness. And it, the more she sees his goodness and realizes how benevolent his plan is towards us, the more radically she begins to embrace herself, embrace for herself hit that plan, and beyond the plan to embrace God himself. And she unleashes a power in the world that I think has rippled through, rippled through human history ever since. It's a powerful, powerful movement of prayer that becomes part of an impulse for. And I think this gift of prayer that she advocates in the church is actually the leading force 
that will through which the renewal of the church will occur i think but it she doesn't start out a great contemplative she has to kind of be invited into it and we can kind of see well not quite kicking and screaming but there was a lot of indifference that needed to be broken through that's i think the real benefit from reading the life of teresa of jesus or the, the life of saint teresa of avila because what you will find in the interior castle and even the way of perfection are these wonderful roadmaps in the spiritual journey. Okay, while other people were out there mapping the world in that that time period of the 1500s, she's really mapping the interior life. But in the life of Teresa, what you're finding is that she's like us. She's almost somebody that is on the journey like we've been on the journey. And in those first couple of chapters that we talked about in our previous episodes, we find you know this young girl who is not only experiencing the loss of her mother, but she is finding a great love for her father, for her family, and a desire to do good, yet she's challenged by the culture and the things around her. And that also looked kind of good at first blush. And her response to that, I think, is not unlike so many of us in our earlier years, and even some of us in our 30s, 40s, 50s still. And yet she has experiences and awakening. As we come into chapter three, she had a woman who took some time and shared with her It wasn't so much the woman that ignited the desire for something more, something deeper, something good, something true, but it was maybe more her witness, wouldn't you say, the nun that she would end up meeting. That's a very important element in how we witness too, isn't it, and how we can help others on that journey. Well. This is uh, absolutely vital, actually. One of the things I do and the work I do is I I work with a lot of vocations. And so the first thing that comes out in chapter three that's worth just mentioning is this nun who begins to talk to St. Teresa about what religious life is actually. And we kind of need that to be recovered in our own time. People who are living a vocation need to kind of step out and reach reach out to the next generation and let them know that this pathway of Christ, which seems so bizarre, is actually meaningful and lives leads to a very fulfilling and rich life. This narrative isn't being told. John Paul II, in the first World Youth Day, it was uh, in Poland. It wasn't really called World Youth Day, but a group of young Poles gathered with him. He he stood on at a it was a naval base that was destroyed by the Nazi Germans. And the story of the naval base was that the, the Polish forces there never surrendered. They fought to the bitter end. They were invited to surrender, but they refused to surrender. They were going to fight to the end. And John Paul II, kind of referring back on that history, he said, The world will never demand very much from you. The world never demands anything from you at all. But Christ, he demands everything. Just like these people who laid down their life for their country, you know, Jesus is looking for generous souls who will not give up and who will fight to the end. And he's not looking for success. He's looking for faithfulness. Well, when someone in their life begins to hear that for the first time, the enemy's immediate attack is, oh, but if you do that, you're going to live just an awful life and it will be too difficult and you'll never be able to persevere. It will be too hard on you. You hear these kind of things. And this is where the witness, the witness of this nun, as you were saying, is so critical. She could say, look, I've tried it. It's not so bad. you know." And what was she doing? She was planting seeds. This nun was planting seeds. She knew that Teresa, she must have known that Teresa would not be able to understand or receive everything she was saying. She planted the seeds anyway. Uh, 
in the same chapter, the reason why this kind of like these mentors for our vocations are so important, there's there's also an old uncle that she she goes to who's a very pious man. And he, again, has her reading books that she would never read on her own, but he has her reading them out loud to him. And again, I think he was very cleverly planting seeds. And she had that experience when you're reading this beautiful literature of not really liking it because it's kind of demanding on your consciousness and on your attention. It makes demands on you. So you you don't really like it. It's not pleasant or convenient to read. But at the same time, when you read it, it fills you with a, a kind of sense of hope and desire for greatness. And these things are beginning to stir in her because of first this nun and then her uncle. And so she begins what you might call the vocational journey of her life. And it's an interesting thing. She's already has some kind of life of prayer. It's very undeveloped. She's backslid since her youth. She's dealing with an illness too, and that also has to be discouraging. We find in chapter three that she's fainting and just not feeling very well at all. So God comes to us even when we're not feeling well. He sends us people when we're not at our very best, and he plants seed kind of like when we're in a vulnerable place And I don't know, I think that what we see going on in chapter three opens up maybe reconsidering, you know, how how do we discern our vocation? And part of vocational discernment is, you know, who do we let in our lives and who do we talk to and, and, and who do we let challenge us a little bit? We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions, which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. I love this chapter because she's so real. I mean, she it will at one point talk about how I started considering I want to do good because she's reading these things and something's calling her. She likes it. She's feeling there's a consolation coming in it. But I don't really want to be a nun, but I don't want to lose this either. So, and I definitely don't want to go to purgatory. I was really close. I was so close to going to hell. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be a nun. 
because going to hell or that's worse than being a nun. And so I'll be a nun. And she just cracks me up. Can you imagine her as she's writing this? She tells the story to sisters. That's the beauty of her writing. You start to laugh with her. And she touches something so human in us, doesn't she? No, she does. And and kind of humorously and self-effacing, she opens up a mystery that is so important for us as we think about how to respond to God's call in our life today, and maybe we've already made our vocational decision, but still original motivations most of the time are not as good as they ought to be. In her case, she really describes for us what she she in fact calls, and the tr- tradition would confirm, servile fear. By itself, servile fear does not really lead to virtue, but it can kind of point you in the right direction, you know? And so it's not like it's completely useless. It's just that you don't want people to live their whole lives with a servile fear, the fear of, and in talking about the fear of hell or even the pains of purgatory. It's enough to make you go, boy, there must be something better in life that, you know, maybe the sacrifice is worth it because, you know, the alternative is so bad. So maybe I can be more generous in my response to God. Insofar as it leads you to ask those kind of questions, servile fear kind of performs a decent function, you know, but it's just not enough for the life of virtue. We can't go through our lives fearing punishment or what might happen if I get something wrong. We need a better reason to go forward. She's going to discover that you know, that as the story unfolds. But she's saying as a teenager, as a young lady, this is what kind of was behind after hearing from the nun and hearing from her uncle and seeing that there was something better. She's going, well, they're kind of living this life and, you know, maybe I can too. And if I do, I won't get, you know, I maybe I, I won't go to hell or spend as long in purgatory maybe I can even go straight to heaven. You know, those seeds have been planted in her. And so it opens up maybe in her heart, a desire to do something beautiful for God, even out of impure motives. And so strong is that desire, she'll even go and ask for her father's permission to enter the convent. Uh, he he doesn't give it, but, but she... Uh, she has been moved enough to begin to act on it. And so this is the last thing I, I really want to kind of specify here that I think is such an important. When God places a gift in your heart, even if your motivations aren't the best motivations, but you know it's the right thing to do, don't wait to act on it, act on it. Even with all the impurities of our humanity and all the selfish motives and fearful things that are going on in us, when God asks us to do something good, beautiful, and true, it is worth us stepping into that and trying to respond to it in some way. And even if we mess it up a little bit in the beginning, God will use our generosity to do something beautiful. And that's really what leads us into chapter four. I'm so struck by what you just said, because I'm going to bring up something that it isn't in the book. I just wonder about it sometimes, that there doesn't seem to be the option for Teresa, even though she's this effervescent, charismatic personality, very likable, but she doesn't seem to be called to the married state. There doesn't seem to be a conversation, at least in the book, about her being open to that. I don't know, maybe It's from watching her own mother suffer through so many pregnancies and a rather early death. Maybe it's the experience of her sisters. Have you ever contemplated that, Anthony, why that didn't seem to be part of that discernment for her? Well, we don't really know if it was or or wasn't. We don't know any of the conversations around that. We, We know that her father was very watchful over her. We know that she was convinced very early on 
that religious life was the safest way for her. The hagiography of the 16th century and the study of the lives of the saints would sometimes be extremely discreet about events in, in somebody's childhood and life that, that were kind of private and didn't really pertain directly to the witness. We don't know, you know so much about that. We do know, though, that you know, the dating habits in the 16th century weren't anything like ours today, and marriages were you know, likely arranged. They, you know, of course, they were happening and so forth, and people fell in love. I mean, uh, John of the Cross, his his parents when they met, uh, even though they were from two different classes, you know, they fell in love and they got married, and so that was going on in the culture. But our own culture has this kind of prolonged period of dating uh, before courtship that I don't think existed so much in the 16th century. You know, y- usually you would meet through family events or some in some way there was a meeting and very quickly the decision towards courtship was made. And for whatever reason, that didn't happen for Teresa of Avila. Instead, though, through these encounters about the time that she could have been dating someone, she has this encounter with this nun, she has this encounter with this old uncle. And the conviction in her heart is that I need to go into religious life for my salvation. It would be dangerous for me not to go into religious life. And somebody could say, that's not a good enough reason to become a religious, but it's a good enough reason to act on it, to begin to explore it. It sounds like all things being equal, the father would much preferred his his daughter get married. And he liked having Teresa around. She must have been a character to have around. And um, he enjoyed her her presence. And so he wasn't eager for her to run off into a convent. He might have preferred if she got married because then he could still be involved in her life in some way. But once somebody enters a convent, it seems like they're dead to you and dead to the world. He was afraid to let go of her. I mean, that's a, a little bit of an unstated part of this story that has bearing, you know, as she goes forward, she's going to enter the convent without him knowing about it because she's She's afraid of disobeying him, but she feels driven to go into to this life. Oh, and she so, talks her brother into going too. She's not exactly going to go alone. There's a section where she said, and I talked my brother into considering this. So he runs off with her to go to the monastery where her friend is. And isn't that something that she didn't pick the her first choice, the convent, of the monastery where that nun that spoke to her, she didn't choose that convent. She wanted to go to a place that she felt maybe a little bit more comfortable because a friend was there. Yes, and so the the convent of the Incarnation, which was a, a Carmelite convent. You know what's going on with the Carmelites? I don't know if we mentioned this, but they've been in Europe now for maybe three three and a half centuries. And they started out as hermits in the Holy Land. And because uh, the Crusaders eventually lost the Holy Land, they came back to Europe. And Innocent III said, well, we can't have any new religious orders. So you need to, you know, you want to do something new. You need to make yourselves look a little bit like, you know, either the Franciscans or the Dominicans. And so they mitigated their rule and started cloistered convents of women. And, uh, and this spread through Sp- Spain and into the town of Avila, where Teresa is. And so now, you know, there's been a couple centuries of, of Carmelites in Spain living this kind of life. But religious life at that time, although quite austere by our own standards, also was kind of in a lax period overall. And so we the mixed motives, I, I said, you know, you're going to find all kinds of mixed motives as you go to serve the Lord. And they're not apparent to you at the time, but she wants to be with her friend, her friends in this community. And this community is a, a little bit loose around the sisters being able to interact with the public. So it's not a strict cloister like the Carmelites are, are today are. At that time, it was a little bit looser. And compared to our life now that is filled with so many comforts, you could you could look at it and go, well, it's still a pretty austere way of life. 
and that that would be that would be true. But the incarnation at this stage of the game was kind of a sleepy convent where the you know the expectations that there was the religious discipline there there were there was a rule that was being observed there was obedience but there was also kind of a lifestyle too that was comfortable for the 16th century and allowed you to maintain your kind of the attachments you had in the world and and to cultivate you know different kinds of friendships that aren't quite compatible with religious life teresa will be on a journey as her heart is purified, she'll realize how she needs to change. But all of this is to say, it doesn't have to be perfect to say yes to Jesus. It just has to be a yes to Jesus. And he makes things perfect and he makes them better. You can trust in him. And so if you if you go, oh, I went into this, I had all these mixed motives. Maybe I chose the wrong thing. No, he was with you the whole way, all through your mixed motives and all the confusion in your heart before you said yes. And even the thing you said yes to, whether it was marriage or religious life, and it hasn't quite turned out the way you thought it was going to turn out, he was behind it. And you can be confident in him. And he has a plan for you. And this is what Teresa of Avila helps us see. Teresa of Teresa de Jesus, she helps us see that if you trust God, he is going to guide your decisions. And you can be at peace with that. You don't have to have doubts and insecurities about every decision you've ever made in your life. You can live confidently in the love of Jesus. Well, that's beautiful. I can't wait to continue our conversation on this life, who may have thought she was going into a comfortable experience at the monastery, but then she would hit this wall called suffering. And I guess that's something that we're going to have to hold off till next time. But until our next conversation. Any final thoughts, Anthony? Well, just to underline this idea, you know, in our hearts, we'll find movements of servile fear and we'll find ourselves do things, join, uh, make commitments, and we'll discover all kinds of mixed motives. And we'll also discover they're not as perfect as we thought they were going to be after we got in. None of this thwarts God's plan. He's not thwarted by the imperfections in our hearts or in the world. He chooses to act in those imperfections to bring about something beautiful, to bring about our holiness. And our main job is to trust him. And this is the journey that Teresa of Avila is on. She has the example of this beautiful nun and the example of an old uncle and her own experiences of every time she takes a step towards this, she receives one blessing after another. And God will take her from the place of insecurity to security with him. She has, she learns to trust. I can't wait till our next conversation. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you, Chris. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or on whatever platform you obtain your podcasts. There, too, you can also listen to an audio version of the complete autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will First, pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis.